And uh, okay, it's recording now. So welcome everybody to our third lecture in the Cambridge Homeschool Lecture Series online. And today we're really excited because our own deputy head teacher, Mr. Boylan, is going to give us a talk on leadership. And by way of introduction, I'll just say two things about him. He is an excellent business teacher and he understands business and success in business extremely well. And secondly, um, I've known him for a bit longer than you, uh, probably for about eight years now. And I would say unreservedly that he is um, one of the most accomplished and instinctive and um, just excellent leaders that I have met and worked with in a school. It pains me to say so, given mm. that he is so much younger than myself and so much less experienced and yet so much wiser. So I hope you're going to all listen very, very well <coughs> and um, enjoy the talk. Thank you, Mr. Boylan. Excellent. Thank you, Mrs. Trafford. This is going to be an interesting talk, folks. Uh, it's going to give you a slightly different perspective on me and on my background and on sort of how I've got to this point in life. Um, and you're going to learn a little bit, not just about me, not just about leadership, but you're also going to learn a little bit about Ireland and a little bit about peace over the course of the next 50 minutes or so. So welcome. The, the topic of this lecture is leadership, but we will touch on other things within that. But everything we will touch on all comes back to leadership. Now, I hope you can see my screen all OK. Now, the first question that we're going to start with is what do you think a leader is? And the reason I ask this question is because I bet it doesn't mean the same thing for everyone. I'm going to give you a few seconds. You, you, it's sort of a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer it. I just want you to reflect on what you think a leader is. And that's a very, very interesting question because essentially when we're told in the world of business, whether it's at university, whether it's doing a degree or a master's or any sort of research into leaders, we always come across two words. We come across the idea of the word vision and the word followers. So a leader is someone with a clear vision and they have followers. People buy into the idea of their vision. If you don't have followers, you're not gonna be a very good leader because you might have an idea or a vision, but people aren't gonna follow you. So it's not going to work. And if you have uh, followers, but no vision, again, it won't work because it just simply doesn't work. So you need these two things to come together. You need this individual with a vision, what something they're trying to achieve. When we talk about vision, it's something we're trying to achieve. And then we need people to buy into that. We need one, two, hundreds, thousands, and in many cases, millions and tens of millions of people to follow this leader's example. So a leader can be on a very small scale, or a leader can be on a massive global scale in terms of billions of people. Now, I've intentionally chose five very, very different people. Some very polarizing people on this screen. And of course, we have our own, very own Dr. Page, who I hope isn't uh, polarizing. But we have got Boris Johnson, ex Prime Minister of the UK, Vladimir Putin, Donald Trump, Alex Ferguson, and Steve Jobs. Completely different people. But I need you to understand something. The question here isn't about whether we agree with these people or not, OK? The question is, are these people leaders? And the answer to all of these people on my screen, there's six different people here. The answer is yes. And the answer to that is yes, because they have a vision and they have followers. And I think many of you will ask yourself a question. And I've done something intentional here. I wonder if anybody can spot what it is. I've intentionally done something with my selection of six people. Can anyone tell me what all of these six people have in common? 
if you can, I can't actually see if anyone's uh, got their hand up, Miss Trafford. So if you can direct the audience, I can't actually see it because I'm sharing my screen. But does any, can anyone tell me what these six people have in common? You got a teacher. Your a teacher. Is... Uh, thank you, Mrs. Trafford. Uh, I think what all these six people in common have. Uh, well, I actually don't know much about Dr. Page in this regard, but most of the people on the screen uh, are very controversial at, in their visions. Possibly, but that isn't the reason I intentionally chose these six people. They're all leaders, don't get me wrong. I wonder what Ross thinks. Ross McKenzie's got his hand up. Ross. <clears throat> I can I can't hear Ross. Mrs. Trafford, do you want to have a guess? What why have I intentionally chose these six people? I'm trying to make a point. Well, I, the, my, the feminist comments? side of me has immediately said they're all male, sir. Ex exactly right, Miss Trafford. And, and and the one thing which I have noticed, if I look back over history, and, and the reason I've intentionally did this, because I wanted to make it thought provoking. The one thing that's changed dramatically over history is the amount of female leaders we have. And we'll see one of, we'll see probably my favorite female leader coming up in the presentation later on. But what the biggest shift in my whole time studying business and leadership, the thing that stood out to me the most is in the last 20, 30, 40 years, the huge, huge increase in female leaders. Some people, I don't know why, subconsciously, and, and studies show this, automatically assume a male, and I don't know why. But the one thing we have to recognise is that society has moved on in such an incredible way that there is now more female leaders of top businesses than ever before, which is a real, real positive. So remember, leaders can be anyone, but the reason I've chosen these particular uh, six, of course, we all recognise these names. We all, of course, know Dr. Page, Alex Ferguson. I'm a Manchester United fan, myself and Claus. Steve Jobs, we all have at least one Apple product. And these three people I've chosen for a, a reason as well. Because the next thing I want you to think about is this. Does a leader have to be a good person? Because by the definition of a leader, I'm not making a judgment on any of these people. That's not for, that's not my uh, position today. It's it's up for you to decide. But essentially, the answer is no. One of the most influential leaders in history was Hitler. Does anyone agree with that Hitler was a good person? I would hope everyone would staunchly say no. But it doesn't mean they weren't a leader, because a leader is someone who gets people to buy into their philosophy. And it's the same in all walks of life. Just because you're a good leader doesn't make you a good human being. So that's something to really, really think about. So in my opinion, it's about getting the balance right. You want to be a good leader, but I think you shouldn't be a good leader at the perspective that you sacrifice your principles and your morals, but often that will happen. So. Just because you're a good leader doesn't necessarily make you a good person. So I'm not saying I approve of, for example, some of the more controversial people on my previous slide, but we have to recognize that they're still leaders, whether we agree with them or not. So we, we get to this idea, what makes a great leader? And it's a really, really interesting question. What makes a great leader? And the answer is quite simple. There isn't one answer. It depends on a range of circumstances, but you need personality. You very rarely will see a good leader that doesn't have personality and good people skills. Why? Because that word followers, if someone doesn't have a personality, which you can relate to and a strong message and they're not a good communicator, then they are probably not going to be a good leader. So in order to be a good leader, you need people skills. We call this interpersonal skills. You need communication skills. You need to be creative. You need to be innovative. And why do I say creative and innovative? Because remember, 
you need a vision. And the vast majority of people aren't capable of coming up with a vision for society, a country, a business. So this is what separates leaders, this innovation, this creativity. Some of you may have heard of Elon Musk. Very, very, very interesting person. The thing that makes him stand out so much as a good leader to me is he is so innovative, such a visionary, whether it's buying Twitter, whether it's competing with all the global cure giants and taking Tesla to be in this one huge brand who no one's ever tried to take on Volkswagen, Audi, BMW, but he did and he succeeded because he had a vision. He was brave. He was bold. The same with his idea of SpaceX. Again, a really crazy, creative, innovative mind, but a risk taker. Leaders take risks. And you think Steve Jobs as well. Steve Jobs. If you don't know who Steve Jobs is, this is the, one of the, prob well, the most influential person in the history of Apple. It is Steve Jobs is the reason you have iPhones. Steve Jobs is the reason there's an app store and there's there's Apple Music. And the reason why we're all carrying around these little computers in our pockets called uh, smartphones. So what makes a great leader is a range of different things. But also, it depends what we judge their success on. If we only judge their success on monetary value, which I don't, then we're forgetting about something else. A good leader as well is someone with compassion. Someone who cares, someone who values people, someone who looks after people, someone with empathy. It depends on how you measure the success of a leader. Of course, you have to measure their success by final outcome because of the business or the organization fails. Well, they're probably not a very good leader, but you can still be a good leader and show these great human characteristics. In my spare time, I like to support Manchester United. It's given me many uh, sleepless nights and made me unhappy many times, as well as given me possibly the happiest moment of my life in 1999 when I watched them win the treble in the Champions League final. Uh, I never forget the time I jumped up in the living room on the seat and hit my head of the roof when um, Manchester United won and my dad and me was laughing. It's one of the memories I will always treasure. And this person gave me that memory. And Alex Ferguson is the most successful British football manager of all time. And some people will be thinking, but this is a school, this is academic. Why are you getting us to listen to a football manager? Well, in Alex Ferguson's spare time, he runs a course at Harvard Business School, arguably the best business school in the world. Because actually, it's not just about reading a textbook, it's about the practical leadership skills which Alex Ferguson has. So I'm just going to play a short little clip here. Miss Trafford, you can just let me know if you can hear it, okay? It should be okay, I think. When we teach the Manchester United case, uh, and you've seen that happen uh, several times now. What do you feel are the are the key learnings? Everyone who worked for Manchester United knew who Alec Ferguson was. I didn't change. Because I think that when the people change their mind all the time or change their philosophies all the time, it can be confusing to work staff. I've come to Aberdeen, north of Scotland, to manage Manchester United, biggest brand football brand in the world. I'll tell you, I was scared. I had a lot of trepidation about it because this is a massive club. But I said to myself, I am not going to change. I am not going to change. I'm going to do what I believe in. And I wasn't afraid to do that. I think that fears can kill people. But it's also, also can be an inspiration to you. Now you're, you're a business mogul in many ways or a business influencer. Has that really hit you that, that now across the world business leaders are listening to what you have to say about leadership and managing teams? In a 26 year period at United, what it was achieved is extraordinary really. When I joined United, they're worth 10 million. It's now worth 2 billion. So that is an incredible uh, progress and it's not all down to Alec Ferguson. You know, that's down to the, those fantastic players I had, marvellous players. And the pleasing thing about it is not only did we produce good young footballers, we pr produce good human beings. What I was good at as a young coach was young people. 
My first job and no money. So what did I do? I coached, I scouted, I trialed young people. And I was good at it. And you've said that as a leader, as a manager, you play different roles at different times. And one approach might be suitable for one player, but not for another player. So it's constantly trying to find, presumably, what is the right style for each individual. Yeah, well, you have to be versatile at that. You have to motivate human beings. You have to try again to, to be the best they possibly can be. And I think also that um, recognition, to recognize your work staff and praise them. Because um, I always feel the value is that you're building a fort around yourself, you know, that you're, you're, you recognize the contributions made on a regular basis by people who you depend on. Most managers who are successful stick with whatever formula brought them that success and maybe hang on to it for too long. But your willingness to, to evolve and to adapt to that change in the, uh, in the environment and in, and in science was really uh, quite unusual. I think the important thing is to accept change. What worked 25 years ago didn't necessarily mean it was going to work forever more. So we're always moving all the time, always forward. But if you believe in something, don't be afraid to do it. I was a gambler. Didn't matter to me. The risk was was worth it. The intention was to win the match. That's my job. To send fans home, back home happy, to make sure that I've done everything possible to get the result. Did you think back in the day that some of those lessons that you were learning might ever be applicable to the wider area of business? I don't look at myself as a professor of educational abilities as some of the people we've been meeting in the last few years. But nonetheless, I think there is a, a certain element of my career that can help people. No matter what industry you're in, whether it's football or finance, or a doctor or, 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 or in a hospital, leadership qualities are, are similar. I love that three minute clip because it's, it's really, really interesting. And the reason I like it is not, it's, of course, I'm a little bit biased because that's one of my idols on that screen. But he talked about turning a 10 million pound business into a 2 billion pound brand in 26 years. And now that's unbelievably impressive to turn something under your leadership from 10 million to 2 billion. He talks about having a vision, a philosophy, having clear values. But he also believes in something which I believe in. He talked about the value of human beings. He doesn't talk about himself and his own ego there. He doesn't really take any self-praise. He deflects it, he tries to talk about his players, and he particularly talked about the importance of developing good human beings. So of the leader of a, t of a business that he turned from t oh, 10 million pounds into 2 billion pounds, that's a lot of extra zeros, believes in the value of instilling good human beings, developing good people, well, then it's good enough for me. So I think we never deflect from our values. No matter what we're trying to achieve in life, we need to stick to our core values and still be a good person because it's not worth sacrificing your core values for, for, for any sort of financial gain. So I come to myself this question next, am I a leader? And it's not really for me to say, but I think I am. But I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you a story about how I sort of discovered I'm a leader. I discovered I'm a leader by accident. When I was in school, I was quite quiet, believe it or not. I sort of sat in the corner, did what I needed to do, and got on with it. I just wanted to get away and play football, whatever it may be. So when I was at school, for the first number of years of my school life and primary school and secondary school, I had no idea whatsoever that I had the ability to be a leader. And the reason for that was there was other people around me that were louder, that were more confident, that made a bit more noise and got a bit more attention. So I sort of just by default assumed they were the popular ones. They must be the leaders because I didn't quite understand. And then I got a part time job at the age of 16 working in a chicken factory. Yes, a chicken factory in Ireland. Um, I now live about two miles from that chicken factory. So. But it wasn't until I started working in that chicken factory, believe it or not, as a, as a young person at 16, I used to work weekend shift. I used to work on a Friday afternoon and on a Sunday. So after school on Friday, I went straight to the chicken factory and I would work from 4.30 to 
And then a Sunday, I would work from 11.30 to 9. And that was pretty much what I was doing when I was 16. And it wasn't even in the first year there, I didn't realize. I had been there. I started in the July. And it wasn't until the following, 15 months later, the following November, 16 months later, I actually realized I was a leader. And it happened by accident because I didn't realize until someone pointed it out to me. Someone was ill one day, one of the supervisors. And now you have to remember, I was 17 at this stage, 17 in only a couple of months. And all the other people around me were 30, 40, 50, some even in their 60s. Some, Many of them older than my parents at that age, most of them. And it wasn't until this person came to me and said, I want you to run this line. Uh, Johnny's ill. That was the name of the person. And I'm like, what? What, what do you mean? <laughs> they said, I, I, I think you're, you're the best person to run this line. I'm like, OK. I'm like, I was just being polite. I was too shy to say no. So guess what? I ran the line. And I ran it that day. And I came back in the next day. And the person was still in. And they asked me to run it again. And two things happened. A, I started to believe in myself, and B, I realized I could do it. I realized, actually, I was a leader. I, I realized that the idea of age was a load of nonsense. I was sort of scared because I felt I was too young to be a leader, because how could someone at 17 start telling someone at 55 or 60 what to do? And it was this was sort of a weird moment in my life when I realized actually not only was I probably a leader because I was able to get people to buy into what I was doing but actually I really enjoyed it I really enjoyed looking after these people and trying to get the best out of them and it's sort of been something I've always done ever since then because it gave me that confidence and, and what lesson has that learned me well it's taught me one incredibly valuable lesson it has taught me the lesson that I think even if you don't think you're a leader, you won't know until you try to take yourself out of your comfort zone. Don't say no to things within reason, of course. I want you to say no to things that aren't good, but but take risks. Challenge yourself. Um, am I a good leader? I'm, I'm not sure. It's not for me to say. It's for other people. You will know. You all see me every day. But. I know I can do it because of that experience I had at 17. That was the moment I changed. So if you think now, listen to me, I'm not sure if I'm a leader. For some of you are. I know some of you are. Some of you are incredible leaders already. But if you aren't showing really strong leadership skills at the moment, don't worry. But challenge yourself. Take on responsibility. Try and lead things from the front. Now, this is... You will never. This is the only time you will ever hear me talking about the, the history of Ireland. I avoid it at all costs. It's a very, very controversial area, but I think it will help you understand my background. Um, there is, for some of your parents that are watching on, for, for, for some of the staff, there is nine people on the screen. And these are the nine people that are the most important leaders in my life. And, and I've been, there's no parents here. These are all political leaders. If you don't know who they are, I'm actually going to talk you through them. This is Jerry Adams in the top left, who there's a political party called Sinn Féin. This is Bertie O'Hearn here, who was high up in the Irish government, the head of the Irish government. This is Tony Blair, the ex-UK Prime Minister. This is Bill Clinton, the ex-president ex of America. This is David Trimble, the leader of one of the big unionist parties, uh, the, the UUP in, in Northern Ireland. This is Ian Paisley. Um, the leader of the Democratic Unionist Party in Northern Ireland. You've got John Hume on the left here, who is the head of the SDLP. And you have John Major, um, who again was playing a key part in the beginning. He was the prime minister before Tony Blair. And then you have this lady called Mo Molum, who is the secretary of state. Um, and why are these people so important to me? Well, you might be surprised to know that you might hear of Ireland now as this lovely place where... They're, they're famous for Guinness and they're famous for St. Patrick's Day and they're famous for being happy and positive and enjoying themselves. But Ireland hasn't always been uh, a really nice place to live. My memories of growing up as a child, I have, you know, I, I've seen gunshots being fired. I've seen lots of things I'm very glad I don't see anymore. Um, 
I have seen lots of things, even at primary school, on my way to primary school, many, many times. I used to, every day on the way to primary school, I used to get searched by the army to check that I wasn't carrying anything, which was slightly mad, but it shows you anyone that was even carrying a rucksack back then was being searched. So growing up, it was very, very difficult. And, and it was very difficult because essentially you've got a, a weird situation where you have two communities. You have got the, the Catholic community, and you have got the Protestant community, which you may also hear called the nationalist or Republican community, which falls under the category of the Catholic community, or the unionist or loyalist uh, community, which falls under the, the Protestant community. And it seems so weird because to most people, religion's meant to be about something that's spiritual. Religion's meant to be about something um, which is a personal thing. It shouldn't be divisive. I've read many religious books from all faiths. Not one of them say we should be divided. They're all about the idea of morals and values and looking out for each other. And the reason I put these nine people on the screen is because Ireland did not have peace. There was lots of death, lots of tragedy, lots of things which is was terrible happening. And it was these nine people who realistically didn't like each other. Most of the people on this screen were arch enemies. Um, if you look at the this this person, Jerry Adams, and this person, Ian Paisley, if you ask your parents, they'll tell you these two people, you can't find two people that probably hated each other more in life than these two. But they recognised that this killing, this death, this tragedy couldn't go on. And they had to step up and show leadership. They had to lead by example to stop the tragedies that were happening, to make life better for people, to make life better for the people that live here. Because why would you want to? There was people attacking each other, their neighbours, people in their own community. And it was the work of these nine people, and I know there was others, but to me, these are the most influential nine that made us have peace in Ireland. It made it that I can walk out now and I have no, with no fear. It means you can walk around freely and happily. And that's why I've said these are the most important nine leaders in my life. There was a a short video, it's about 10 minutes. I'm only going to show you a little bit of it because most of you won't know anything about the history of Ireland. It's an incredibly complicated little place. I'm going to go to the fifth minute here to give you a little bit of With context. Britain in the depths of a brittle European war, Irish Republicans staged a rising in Dublin in 1916. Over the coming years, Irish Republicans would fight against British rule, driving them to a stalemate. During the fighting, the to help you sort of understand the context, because I don't want to have to show you it all. And this is from Queen's University in Belfast. So it's not coming from me. It's coming from one of the Russell Group unis that I'm sure many of you will be applying to. It's trying to sort of briefly summarise. But the concept is you have got still here today, some people that are British and some people that are Irish. It's, I think, the only country in the world where you've got the right to either be two different nationalities based on when you were born. If you're from, North, if you live in Northern Ireland, you have the right to claim Irish citizenship or the right to claim British citizenship. And this gives you a little bit of context into why. The Unionists in the North were sure that no matter what the outcome, they wanted to remain part of Britain. And in 1921, the Ireland was divided and Northern Ireland was created, with the majority of the population being Protestant. The rest of Ireland gained independence, with a parliament in Dublin, and went on in 1948 to declare itself a republic. The two newly formed states built identities around the dominant religious and ethnic groups. The Catholic Church dominated in Ireland, whilst Unionists in Northern Ireland formed a large majority in the new assembly in Belfast, effectively creating a Protestant parliament and a Protestant state. The Orange Men parades flew their flags of the Union even more. However, around one third of the people living in Northern Ireland were Catholic. Many of these people found themselves effectively excluded from political processes and also discriminated against in terms of obtaining jobs and public housing. They were frequently stopped from flying their flags in parades. After the Second World War, everything started to change. In the 1960s, seeing the civil rights marches in the USA, some Catholics and liberal Protestants in Northern Ireland began their protests against discrimination. Lots of people were protesting, parading and waving flags and banners again. Demonstrations were opposed by the Unionist Northern Ireland government and policed by the largely Protestant police force, the Royal Ulster Constabulary. And what began as peaceful protests escalated into violence. 
the plea for civil rights was met with a cry of no surrender. In 1969, violence had spread to urban working class residential areas where existing segregation between nationalists and unionists was increasingly expressed through intimidating confrontations. Riots became frequent, policing was ineffective and in August 1969, the government sent in British soldiers to relieve the police force. The Irish Republican Army claimed the right to use violence to force the British state to leave the six northern counties of Ireland. The IRA began attacking the police and the British Army and conducted a bombing campaign across Northern Ireland and England. To further complicate the dynamics of the conflict after 1969, two pro-state paramilitary loyalist organisations loyal to the British throne, known as the Ulster Volunteer Force and the Ulster Defence Association, also conducted a violent campaign against those seeking to bring down the state and often sometimes against civilian Catholics. There were even more demonstrations and parades. In 1971, internment without trial was introduced in which many people were imprisoned if even suspected of being involved with the IRA. If they weren't involved before, many were very ready to get involved after their experiences. Atrocities caused by both sides occurred across the North and beyond. By the 1980s, the prisoners had lost their political status. Various protests, such as the Dirty Protests and the Hunger Strikes, brought huge pressure internationally on Britain. This violent military confrontation saw over 3,500 people die and tens of thousands injured between 1969 and 1998. The majority of these casualties were non-combatants. This state of emergency, referred to by some as the Troubles and by others a war, saw an extraordinary military presence from the British state and some highly repressive practices in order to defeat the IRA. But times were changing. In 1994, the main paramilitary groups, the IRA, UVF and UDA, called ceasefires as part of an ongoing political process. In 1998, a multi-party agreement known as the Good Friday Agreement or the Belfast Agreement was reached that set up a power-sharing government in Northern Ireland. This agreement, legislated by British and Irish governments, allows the expression of Irish and British identities equal legitimacy allows for power to be shared by the major political groups and provides a mechanism whereby whenever the majority of people in Northern Ireland wish to join the Republic of Ireland, then the British state will facilitate this. So I just wanted to show you something very brief. I wanted to get across uh, one, one thing from that little clip, that they had a scenario where people just couldn't agree and unfortunately it was leading to violence, which of course was a disaster and no one was winning here. But it took these very, very brave leaders, it took these people to make change, to show leadership. That these people were ostracized from certain parts of their own community because it was even considered bad to speak to the other side. So to show true leadership is sometimes it's not about being popular. It's about sticking to your values. It's about sometimes the greater good. And the reason, and that just gives you an idea of what it was like. And these images might seem so crazy because it's something you might see from movies or you think off from war. But this was happening when I grew up. I was seeing this on a daily basis. I was seeing tragedy every day of my childhood. And unfortunately, it led to, you know, almost 4,000 people being killed. Um, 50,000 people badly injured. So this had to stop. And it took leadership, real leadership from all sides of the community to make this stop. So the point, however, is that leaders are not only politicians. I've chosen these politicians and they're not only business leaders. People in local communities, community leaders, were key leaders during what we call this peace process, the idea of bringing peace to this island to make it a better place to live. I think this is really interesting. Leadership often comes ground up. Not always from the top, comes from the people further down the chain. And it's the same in any organisation. All of the leadership can't just come from the top. You can't rely on Dr. Page and Ms. Trafford and, uh, and Mr. Boylan to show all the leadership. No, leadership comes at all levels. If the students show leadership, the prefects show leadership, the house captains, the head pupil team, the teachers, success coaches, leadership comes in many forms. 
And the key thing to remember is you all every single day have opportunities to show leadership, whether that is running a club, running a society, delivering a lecture, delivering a talk, going out into your local community and helping charitable causes. There's so many opportunities for you to show leadership, but you have to grasp them. You have to grasp them. Why was leadership so important in Northern Ireland? Where, where, where I live, where I was born? Well, it prevented further casualties. It was very, very sad. I, I wish I could tell you uh, some better news, but this is tragic a, a tragic headline. Without leadership, this would have continued. But look at this stat, which I think is the most startling of all. There was a 200% increase in the number of graduates, the number of people that were completing university degrees. Why? Because these nine people that I showed, I showed earlier, they found stability. They found peace in the side. Of them. So people didn't have to worry about fighting their neighbours arguing over pointless things they could they had the conditions to have a healthy and prosperous life and a 200 percent increase in the number of graduates in a 20-year period that alone tells you why it was so important for them people to show leadership they changed this place completely this is now an amazing place but only because of the leadership shown by them people they 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 took a risk they did something that maybe wasn't popular. And now Northern Ireland is pretty much a, a model globally about how peace can be achieved. Not only do we have peace here, but we have prosperity. We have success. It's the aspect of it, Ireland's one of, one of the strongest countries in the EU and Northern Ireland's uh, the second fastest growing economy in the UK outside of London. It's growing faster than all other parts of the UK except London. Why? Because we have got peace. We've got amazing people here that now, instead of fighting with each other, now try to get along. And that's led to Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Citigroup, Danske Bank, and many, many others setting up business here. Why? Because of them nine courageous people that helped get us peace, that showed that brilliant leadership. This is, I always look at these two people and, and, and I'm not sure you will know who they are. I've mentioned one of them already. The guy on the left is, is Ian Paisley. The guy on the right is Martin McGuinness. Two sworn enemies, two, two, two guys that hated each other and, and unfortunately they have both passed away now. But actually, these two people, they really, really hated each other. And, and I can't emphasize that anymore they despised each other why because those conditions were made to think that you're a catholic you're bad you're a protestant you're bad and it just didn't work out a silly religious divide they never give themselves a chance to get to know each other but guess what when we had peace and they actually started to talk they realized they actually quite liked each other they famously got the nickname the Chuckle Brothers. Why? Because every time they were together, they were laughing. I, I, I love this picture because it sort of reminds me of the progress that, that, that we have made as a result of leadership. But these two people, because of their leadership, ensured we have peace. While they were at the top, we had the most stable government we've ever had in the history of this country. Because actually they recognised that they're both human beings. Let's strip everything back. And they realized that they had so much in common. And that's why sometimes it's important for us to not judge people. It's important for us to not judge people because of how they speak, because of their, the, the, what they look like, because of their nationality, because of anything, really. Judge them after you get to know them as a human being. It's fine to talk to someone and actually realize you've got nothing in common. But I, the most important thing is not to prejudge things. Because of these two guys who were sworn enemies for no logical reason, just because they thought they weren't meant to like each other. They got to know each other. 
and they realized they had so, so, so much in common. So I often get asked, what do I think is the best style of leadership? And the answer is very, very simple. There is no correct answer. There's no right style. It depends on the situation because a good leader will show situational leadership. And, and, and that's echoed in something Alex Ferguson said. Just because you have a line doesn't mean you have to stick to it because sometimes you have to think about the person. Think about the human being in front of you and what is best for them. What is going to get the best out of them? Because if you go back to education in your parents' age and 20, 30, 40 years ago, teachers and students' relationships were really not good. Because teachers were these big scary people who thought the best way to get people to respect you is to shout at them. We've realized that doesn't work. Because one style doesn't fit everyone. It's about looking at the situation in front of you, weighing up everything, and making a decision based on what will give the best outcome. But also, don't forget about human beings. Because sometimes it's okay to sacrifice some profit if it's going to really benefit human beings, society, the environment. So you have to be adaptive. You have to adapt to the situation you find in front of themselves. This is my favorite female leader. Um, and, and the reason Anita Roddick, uh, again, unfortunately she has passed now as well, she famously said, whatever you do, be different. If you're different, you will stand out. If you don't know who this uh, lady was, she is the founder of The Body Shop. And Anita Roddick was like me and you. She was just a normal person. But she became disillusioned with something. She became disillusioned with the fact that uh, pharmaceutical companies, that um, things like shampoos and anything that was being produced was being tested on animals. And she didn't like this. She felt very, very uncomfortable with it. So she didn't just sit there and, and, and think, oh, I'm not happy with this. She made a change. She created the body shop, that iconic brand you will now see in your high street. And she did it based on values, based on her values, her philosophy. She set up the business with a clear set of values, just like Alex Ferguson said. She created a, a monstrous business from nothing, a business that didn't exist. So I was talking about Alex Ferguson and his 10 million into 2 billion. Anita Roddick took a business that didn't exist. It was nothing. It was an idea. And turned it into a global brand, The Body Shop. And The Body Shop was later sold to L'Oreal for 600 and, and, and something million. And she actually, when she passed away, she, she left almost all of her money to good causes. So she left a legacy for sure. She changed the mindset. She 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 didn't just accept that we have to test in animals because we've always tested in animals. No, 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 no. She decided that I want it done differently. And she did that. She had this idea, this vision. Remember I said two words, vision. And people followed her. They bought into her vision. And that's why she was an incredibly successful leader. Richard Branson. Is leadership about taking a risk? The answer is simply yes. Richard Branson has had over 200 failed businesses. It's probably even more now. Why? Because he knows that it's okay. To, if you don't take a risk, you never succeed. So leadership involves not being too risk averse. Take a risk within reason, a calculated risk. Because if you take a risk and it pays off, there's going to be huge rewards. But if you don't take risks, you're not likely to be a very, very good leader. You need to be a risk taker. I'm going to play you something from Jeff Bezos, who's the world's richest man, but it actually isn't anymore, in fact. He's been surpassed in that. I'm just going to show you a little clip on a motivational speech. He created a two-minute motivational video for students. I'm just going to pause for a second. What did Jeff Bezos say here? 
I knew that if I failed, I wouldn't regret it. Let's go back to um, Richard Branson. I knew that if I failed, I wouldn't regret it. But I knew the one thing I might regret is not trying. I knew that if I failed, I wouldn't regret it. But I knew the one thing I might regret is not trying. If we all can take a message from that, I think that would be disappointing. There's nothing wrong with failing. Failing is part and parcel of learning. It's part and parcel of growing. It's part and parcel of becoming a human being. What you won't regret failing probably, but what you will regret is not giving yourself the chance, not taking that little risk. I, I, I'm gonna read it for the fourth time. I knew that if I failed, I wouldn't regret it. This is, I think the second richest man in the world now. But I knew the one thing I might regret is not trying. When you're trying to do a startup company, or I think really anything in life, but you have to, as an entrepreneur, if you're gonna if you're gonna build a company, pick something you think is interesting that has the intersection of genuinely creating real customer value, and then just stay right there and let the wave catch you. I first talked to my my wife, who uh, she had married a. Uh, you know, relatively stable, goofy, but still relatively stable a person working at a Wall Street firm. I worked at a quantitative hedge fund. And uh, this was a hard decision. And I was looking for the right framework in which to make that kind of important decision. And, 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 and the right framework I found is a regret minimization framework. And I, so that's just a nerdy way of saying that you want to project yourself to age 80. And then think back over your life. And, and if, you're, if, you're, if you're 80, what are the, you want to minimize the number of regrets. But it was a, a very clear way for me to think about making that kind of life decision. Uh, and, the, and, and, and the way it helped was I, I thought, okay, if I go do this thing and participate in this thing called the internet that I genuinely believe is going to be a big deal, and if I fail, am I going to regret having tried and failed? And I knew the answer to that was no. But I also knew that if I didn't try, that I would always regret that. Step by step, ferociously. Basically, you can't skip steps. You have to put one foot in front of the other. Things take time. Uh, you, there are no shortcuts. And uh, but uh, but you want to do those steps with you know passion, and ferocity. Okay. So now I'm gonna pause it there for a moment, and I'm gonna see if anyone has any questions for me. Um. Is there anyone would like to ask me anything at all about anything I've spoke about, anything I have said, anything that you have really thought about? Um, we we have Ahmed, sir, who's got his. I hand can now up. see. I've stopped sharing, so I now can see all. All right, I'll let you. Right. I'll let you share your own questions. Ahmed, I'll go to you first. Ahmed. Hi. Um. I just wanted to ask, um, Jeff Bezos, really? Well, I go back to what I said, Ahmed. We don't have to agree with someone to recognize they're a good leader. If you've seen the faces I had on at the start, because actually it's impossible to argue that Jeff Bezos is a good leader. It's, mm -hmm. you certainly may not like him as a human being. And, and, and I think it's easy to say why well, maybe you don't like him. But it's impossible to say he isn't a good leader because remember, we're not judging people on whether they're good people. We're judging them on if they're a good leader because he came from a small idea to become an at one stage the richest person in the world. And, and not only that, but obviously look at Amazon. Right. We may not I like how he treats yeah. his staff. You know, because I one of the things you will have heard me say is I think it I disagree with a lot of them because some of the leaders don't look at the human side of things, which I think is every bit as important 
Um, but he's still been incredibly successful. I do not like in the slightest, Ahmed, how he treats people. I, I despise, in fact, how he treats people. However, we have to recognize what is a leader. They're a person with a vision that has followers. And Jeff Bezos has created a company that is just a, a global monster because of his vision. Of course. Does that make sense, Ahmed? I'm not saying he's a good person, please. I mean, yeah. uh, that, that's up to personal judgment. But one yeah. of the early I just feel like in terms of leadership, saying, right. I just yeah. feel like in terms of leadership, you know, you know, the main core of leadership, like I think you mentioned, is, you know, understanding how to um, reach people and understand people and work with people. But, you know, hiring different companies to, you know, outsource um, staff and then have them abuse them so that they wouldn't have to face direct blame is not the best of way. Of course, you've, even, you've also got Donald Trump. Um, of course, who, yeah, sure. whether you like them as a human being or not, whether you agree with what he says, Donald Trump has still convinced tens of millions of Americans that the last election was rigged. So I go back to my point. Is Donald Trump a good leader? Unfortunately, yes. Again, you know, it's not about what I believe, because why? People still, he has convinced them that the last election was rigged. And it's all fake news. And he got uh, scammed. They convinced them that democracy doesn't exist and it was all rigged. So with the point I'm making, we're not talking about if someone's a good person. We're talking about have they got the ability to get followers, to have a vision and get people to buy into it. And that is why these people, regardless of their morality, are excellent leaders, whether we like it or not. Uh, I will go to Daniel. Daniel was there. Well, this isn't really a question, sir, but I just wanted to say I, I I wanted to be a future entrepreneur when I grow up, really. And I say that these videos have inspired me a bit to be a good leader, really. Yeah, because I, I think he said something which I like. I, I, you know, I think an interesting thing to, to consider, Ahmed, is we don't have to like everything with people, but we can still take things. I... You know, regardless of whether I'm a fan of Jeff Bezos, I'm taking his quote and I'm never going to stop thinking about him. Regret minimization. And that, that's something maybe for Daniel to think about. Because, Daniel, there is nothing that will stop you becoming an entrepreneur if you want to be, except not taking that risk. Don't have the regrets. Focus. Give yourself a chance. Be a risk taker like, like these other people. So... In 20 years' ahead. time, Daniel, you yeah. need to be able to look back with no regrets, and then you'll probably be a very, very successful entrepreneur. Thank you. Aditya. Thank you, Mr. Boylan. Uh, first of all, I completely agree. We are not here to judge leaders. Everyone has their own style of leadership and their own way of doing it. But you, a leader's job is to get people to buy into their ideas, and everyone has their own way of doing that as well. But personally, how would you do it? Can you rephrase? Can you repeat the question again? Um, um, sorry, leaders have to get people to buy into their ideas. Would you? So how would I get people to buy into my ideas? Precisely. Is it a natural See, thing? Do you have a strategy? Yeah, I have a strategy. It's very simple. It's to be a good human being. It's to respect people. It's to be nice to them. I, it's why I. I will never take the um, Jeff Bezos approach. I'm not saying Jeff Bezos. How can I say Jeff Bezos is wrong? Jeff Bezos is the wealthiest person in the world. I can't say he's wrong, but it's not what I believe. You know, who am I to judge Jeff Bezos? I'm a school teacher. He's worth hundreds of billions of pounds. But essentially, the what works for me, Aditya, is to stick to my values and to be respectful to people and actually to care about people. Because, and I'll tell you why, Aditya, because when you be respectful to people and they can see that you care about them, and if you need a favor, and you do genuinely care about them, what will happen? They won't let you down. Whereas, if you don't treat people well, what's going to happen if you need them? They're not going to be there for you. It's not very hard to be nice. I was taught at a very young age, it is. it doesn't even cost 1p to be nice to people. It's free. There's always sort of an analogy, Aditya, 
that those people on the way up don't be too arrogant because uh, you'll eventually be coming on the way back down and you have to see all the people you were mean to. So so my philosophy is just simple. Be a good person. Uh, l- look out for people. Um, but also, um, that doesn't mean you can't be innovative. That doesn't mean you can't take risks. You can still be innovative. You can still have a, a drive. You just can be nice to people. It's not very hard to be nice to people, um, which I think some people get wrong. So so my whole philosophy is just being nice to people. Um, within reason, if someone doesn't do what they have to do, I have no problem with um, having a stern word with them. But essentially, most people will be very respectful to you if you're very respectful to them. But if you're not nice to them, why should they be nice to you? No one's better than anyone else. And, and that's sort of my philosophy. Is it right? I don't know, but it's what I think. It's worked for me so far, did you? <laughs> it worked for me when I was 17. And I'll tell you something interesting. When I was 17, um, and the, I was the youngest supervisor in that chicken factory's history. 20 years later, I'm still the youngest su- su- uh, supervisor in that chicken factory's history. I was actually the youngest manager as well. In fact, I was 21 and I was in charge of 115 people. But I was never not nice to them because it's just work. It's just it's, I can't change who I am. Some people think you have to be this really strict authoritarian person, but I can't do that. That's not my personality. My personality is just to be me. So it's all about being because let me tell you this. Did you? you might be able to be really, really authoritarian for a day, but then you have to carry that out every day. And if you start showing inconsistency, people's going to think you haven't got a clue what you're doing. So just stay true to yourself and it will be fine. Some people, it will work because they can be authoritarian all the time. That's not my personality. So you have to also think about what you're good at and play to them strengths. Hafsa. Um, so I was wondering what billionaires have in common because I've I've um heard that billionaires, most of them are like narcissists. Is that true, or is there something else? That's... Um, you ask a good question. I I don't know the answer to that because not all billionaires are bad people. Okay, and I take Anita Roddick for example. She she sold her business. I know it wasn't a billion, but it was six hundred and something million, which isn't far off. And she didn't keep any of it herself. She only gave her children a very very small amount of money. And wanted to donate the rest to good causes because she said, I've given my children enough. Why do I need to give them loads of money? They, they can have their own path in line. I'd rather help out those that are less fortunate. So please don't assume every rich person is a bad person because I think we need to be careful with that because lots of rich people do lots of good things. You know, I don't know an awful lot about Bill Gates, but Bill Gates donates billions and billions of pounds to good causes he may do things which i disagree with i don't know at all to be honest but not all rich people are bad people not all billionaires are bad people some of them may be but some some poor people are bad people as well and some poor people are nice people so i think we one of the things i said it's really important not to make judgments i said this earlier and we spoke about them two people that hated each other you may remember the chuckle brothers they hated each other for no reason so just because someone's rich, we can't prejudice that they're a bad person or that they're a narcissist. We just have to recognize that some people are brilliant and some people maybe aren't. And we can we can't do not I can't do nothing about um Jeff Bezos and how he treats people in his Amazon factories. But I can do something about Mr. Boynan. I can't do anything about him. I, I there's no point in me worrying about what he does. Of course, I want him to be a better person, but I can't do nothing about it. I can't lie in bed at night thinking about it, but I can influence what I do. And I think that's an interesting thing for you to think about. OK, maybe they're so good, maybe they're bad, but if we focus on ourselves, everything else will just be fine. Sir, that is such a positive note to end on. Mm-hmm. We're at 5.30. And uh, it's been a marvellous talk. Thank you so much, especially for sharing from your own childhood experience and explaining a little bit about the history in Northern Ireland. And also for allowing me to hear a lovely Glaswegian accent. So (laughs) I could do some subtitles later. But let's give Mr. Boylan a big 
round of applause for a really fantastic, fascinating talk. Thank you. And thank you. Now, Manchester United start playing at 5.45, so I've got 10 minutes to get changed into my Manchester United jersey and put the football on. It's been lovely. <laughs> okay. it's, been, it's been lovely uh, speaking to you all today, and have a lovely evening, folks. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much indeed. That was brilliant. Well done. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.